Well, good afternoon. Bonjour tout le monde. Comment ça va? Ouais, tout, tout va bien? Okay. We, have, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, autrement, je vous adresserai en, en, en français, mais on n'a pas beaucoup de temps, alors il faut me dépêcher un peu. Uh, uh, alors, commençons with this slide. Oh, parce que le français, ce n'est pas ma langue maternelle, okay? Alors, je vais vous adresser en anglais, okay? Pour, uh, you know. Now, my friends, we don't have a lot of time. So I always start my presentations. I always start my presentations with this one slide. This slide has all the code that you need to follow along later on at home, okay? Take a photo of this one slide. This is the good one. The rest of the slides, terrible, not good. This is the one. This has the code. It has my Twitter coordinates and my email. So if you have questions, n'hésite pas me le poser par email, par Twitter, par comme vous voulez, okay? I'm, I'm at your, uh, I'm at, uh, my, I'm at your disposal. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Before we get too far down the road, and while you're all taking a photo, I want to take a photo too. Is that okay? Can we take a selfie? Now, and the reason I want to do this is because I have a little girl. She's 14. She's my daughter. She's amazing. She's so much smarter than I am. And so whenever I go to these conferences, I like to take a selfie, and I take the selfie, and I say, and I go back home, and I say, see, they listen to me. <laughs> right? It's very, it's very important. So, my friends, I want you to pretend like you're happy, okay? Just pretend. And then, and then we're going to say, open source. And then I take the photo. Is that okay? Can you do that? Okay. One, un, deux, trois. Open source. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Hot sauce. Now, my friends, we don't have a lot of time, so let's get to it. My name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring team. I'm a Spring developer advocate on the Spring team. They made a toy out of me in China. Uh, you can find me there. There's videos on Safari. I have a book called Cloud Native Java. I did a podcast every Friday called A Beautiful Podcast. Uh, I do a blog every Tuesday called This Week in Spring, and I do a weekly a roundup every, two, every Wednesday that introduces something in the Spring ecosystem. It's called Spring Tips, and I'm working on a new book called Reactive Spring. All of that is not what we're here to talk about, though, so let's move on. Today, we're going to talk about testing. Testing is a very important topic. How many of you test? I'm just curious. How many of you are testing? That's not everybody. What's that about? <laughs> it's not everybody. It's not, I don't understand. Are the rest of you PHP developers? <laughs> just doing it in production, like Chuck Norris, just Putting it in the FTP folder? No, it's not a good idea. You need to test. How many of you are doing test-driven development? That's the question. How many of you are doing test-driven development? Oh, that's even worse. Wow, guys and gals, we need to do better. Test-driven development is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about this idea that we're going to write software, and as we write software, we're going to write the tests first. And there's a lot of good reasons for this. There's a lot of reasons why you may want to do this. Test-driven development allows us to write software that we then get to see working as soon as the tests are green. This has several big, important effects for us, okay? The first effect, the first benefit of this approach to using test-driven development is that when you write software, you have to write software that is testable, right? Because you can't write code that you can't test if you're writing the test first, by definition, right? It won't compile, it won't work. The benefit of writing testable code means that you have to write clean, modular, object-oriented code. You have to write code that ha can have its pieces interchanged. You can have one piece taken out and then replaced with something else. This is super important, okay? This is very important. Uh, Test-driven development is very important, right? It gives you clean, object-oriented code. It's better code, right? Also, when you write tests, of course, you get the benefit of having some sort of documentation, right? You know that. That's true whether you write the tests after or before. But you also get the benefit of having something help you think through the design when you do the test first. There's another very big benefit to test-driven development, and this is, to me, the most important. And I think you, my friends, will appreciate this particular benefit most of all. It has to do with this, this ce sentiment de de la joie de vivre, right? It's the joy of life. When you write software and then you write the tests afterwards, afterwards you write the test, it feels like a chore, like an errand. Nobody is excited about writing tests after you have made the code work. It's not very satisfying, is it? It doesn't make you happy. But imagine if you write the test and the test means that the software is done. Now you're done. Now it's not an extra chore. You're done. You can go home, have some food. Go to, go to the park or something, right? Life is better this way. So writing the test first 
actually gives you that, that, in, uh, that, uh, that hit right, in your brain that makes you feel very excited when you have achieved something. People who are programmers, they get into the zone. You know what I mean? You know what the, t- the zone is? When you program for a long time, you sit down at 9 o'clock in the morning, and the next thing you know, it's 9 o'clock at night. Has that ever happened to you? Anybody? Right, it's very easy. It's very fun. If you can get rid of the meetings and the waste of time and all this other stuff, and you can just sit down and write code, and you feel very excited. Every moment, you're making progress, and then you get another milestone. You reach another level. You feel like the code is getting better and better and better. This feedback loop that we are in when you're writing tests like this is extremely powerful. It's called the zone, but programmers are not the only ones who get this, right? You know who else gets this? Uh, People who jog, you know, running, right? When they run, they get closer and closer and closer to the next milestone, and they feel like, oh, I'm so close. I just got to keep going. Remember, people who say that they like to run, they're lying to you. Nobody likes to run. They like to get there, right? Getting there is the thing that's very satisfying. What about video games? How many of you play video games? People love playing video games. You know why? These games give you the impression that you are so close. All you need to do is just go a little bit more, and then you will be there. Finally, one more, one more level, one more round, more, one more whatever. It gives you this sensation in the brain that makes you feel very satisfied. Test-driven development gives you that same sense of euphoria. It gives you that same sense of satisfaction. Instead of making it something that you have to do, like homework or something, right? Instead, it's the same thing as getting something done. So when you see it work on your machine, it's also tested. That means you're done. Whereas before, you see it work on your machine, you're like, oh yes, and then you still have to write the test. This is not a very good experience. Nobody likes this. It's like writing documentation, right? Nobody looks forward to writing documentation because you know it works, right? It's already there. Just look at the code, right? That's not a very good answer. So we need to do better. So we're going to talk about test-driven development, and we're going to talk about it in terms of uh, simple, and then we're going to scale all the way up to the more complex stuff, okay? We're going to talk about basic, basic, basic unit tests all the way to services, and we're going to do that together today, of course. And we have a couple of different approaches that we could take when you do test-driven development. You could do bottom-up or top-down. Okay, Uh, so you go from the top all the way down or you go from the bottom all the way up. Bottom up means you start from the simplest, smallest component and then you write the code for the more gradual, big component. So you might start with the the objects, the domain, and then the services, and then the controllers, and then the APIs and gateways and whatever, and the user interfaces, right? So the big thing is the user interface. In this approach, it's very good if you have lots of teams and you, you have an integration later on, so you have this service here and that service over there, and you know that eventually, later, not now, later, these things will need to connect together, right? You know that they will connect. That integration is, you know, it's very useful, but it's not very scary. You're not worried about it. You, are, you would much rather that this team starts its work and this team starts its work. And so they can work independently of of each other. They can start working on this service at the lowest level, and they can start working on that service. And the integration is not scary, so you'll do it later. You defer that to later, okay? So that's a good reason to start from bottom up. What about top down? Or, Or another way to think about this is inside out and outside in, right? What about outside in? Well, in this case, you are working with the user interface. You're working with the API layer where people are going to integrate first. You, you, you test that and you define it first. When you work that way, what you're doing is you're saying, we don't know how the data will work, we don't know about the persistence, we don't even know about the web tier per se, but what we care about is getting, it, is getting the integration between these services figured out, okay? That's very important. Figuring out that integration sometimes is very scary. And so if you have two teams that must integrate together, You want to figure that out first. You want to take away the risk of your project. In this case, you're working outside in, okay? Which which choice do you have? Which one do you choose? It's up to you. It's up to your, you know, what kind of style do you want? What kind of benefits do you want when you start your testing? Today, we're going to do inside out. We're going to start from the small and scale to the big because I've only got one thing, basically, one client, one service. And also because from my mind, my tiny little mind, this is a more... Uh, approachable way to learn what we're going to talk about. So today, my friends, let's do this. Let's write some code. Uh, And we're going to do that, of course. Of course, we're going to do that by going to my second favorite place on the internet, 
My first favorite place on the internet, of course, is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. The weather is amazing. It is the happiest place on earth. It is better than Disneyland. But if you have not been to production, you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. <laughs> if you are in need of inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee, start that spring <laughs> that I owe. If your children are restless and they cannot sleep, start that spring <laughs> that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion, a sour stomach, after a long night of alcohol abuse and PHP, <laughs> start that spring that I owe. So we're going to build a new application today, my friends. We're going to build a new application using Spring Boot 2.20 GA. By the way, how cool is this? Dark mode. <laughs> awesome. We'll get, thank you. Oh, yeah. Sante. We're going to build a new application called a producer. And we're going to take advantage of some of the options that we have here, some of the choices. A lot of people are confused by this. They don't know when and where to choose which option. So let's explain. First and foremost, we have the choice of packaging. People don't know when to, when to choose which. If by some terrible, terrible, terrible accident of time and space, you find that you have been transported to the distant, distant, distant past, then choose that war. <laughs> but if you're here with me in 2019, then choose that jar. <laughs> this is a big part of my overarching and permanent philosophy of make jar, not war. And again, <laughs> lots of things you could do. Lots of things that you should do. My guiding philosophy. And then, of course, we have the choice of Java. Which version of the JVM would you like to use today in 2019? My friends, there are three choices here. Only two are acceptable. Let's review. Eight is not acceptable. It's not. It's an ancient, creakingly old, gone version of Java 8. So the question then is, uh, from which of these two will you select? Java 11 is the current long-term supported version, and Java 13 is the current supported version. Either one is fine. I would choose Java 13, but whatever you do, don't choose 8. It's not just, it's not just correct technically to use a more newer version. It's also correct morally to, new, to use a newer version more modern version, okay? Do you want to go home and explain to your children that you're still using Java 8? <laughs> Are you ready for that conversation? I think not. Of course not. Use the correct version. Do the right thing. Don't just do it for me. Do it for the children, okay? <laughs> now, we're going to build an application, my friends. We're going to build an application that uses the reactive web support. We're going to use Lumbuck. Lumbuck's a compile time annotation processor that makes Java a little bit easier. Uh, we're going to use reactive MongoDB. OK, so reactive MongoDB, voila, OK. And we're going to bring in um, the Spring Cloud Stub Verifier, or Contract Verifier. And we're going to hit Generate. And that'll give us a new project here that we can open up in our downloads directory, OK? So here we are. I'm going to open this up in my IDE. It doesn't matter what IDE you use. Anything will work just fine. NetBeans, great. Uh, and, uh, uh, Spring Tool Suite or Eclipse are both great. Uh, Visual Studio Code, awesome. Right? Emacs, awesome. Uh, well, sort of. Atom. Uh, Atom is great. Right? Uh, IntelliJ is fine. Uh, anybody here using Emacs? I'm just curious. Is anybody here using Emacs? Uh, whenever I go to a, every single country I go to, every single city and country I go to, I always ask, who uses Emacs? And always, always I see one hand. <laughs> it's the same guy. <laughs> Every single city and country that I go to all around the world, I say, who uses Emacs? And he says, I do. And then he leaves, <laughs> going to the next city or place. I don't know why. Probably to troll again. So anyway, my friends, we have a brand new build here. I'm going to make the font. Actually, that's fine. You can see that font, right? That's huge. Good stuff. 
We're going to make that, uh, we're going to leave that as is. I've got all the defaults there. I am going to use JUnit 4 because I think that's probably what most of you are familiar with. So I'm going to delete that dependency. It's going to ask me to enable auto import, which I shall do. Uh, and then we're going to go to our code. And here you can see we've got our public static void main and we've got our test. Now, this is a JUnit 5 test. You can certainly use it, but we're using JUnit 4. And anyway, this is not a very good test, so I'll delete it, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to build an application that tests or that works with data of type reservation. Okay, it's an entity that we're going to create a document that's going to be persisted in MongoDB. So I'm going to create a reservation POJO test. It's just going to test the regular Java object. This has nothing to do with persistence or anything yet. Okay, so it's going to be an, a public method create. Okay, we're just going to create a new object like this, and we're going to create a new object so like so. We're going to say reservation like that, uh, and we're going to Remove this. Good stuff. Okay, look at that. Now we're going to create that class. It's just an entity, and I'm going to create. A, I'm going to use the constructor. I'm just going to prove that this constructor works correctly. Okay, that's all I want to do. Now, as I write code, I'm getting errors. Compilation errors are test failures, so you have to fix them. I could create the constructor as I go, like that, surely, but I don't like to do that. So instead, I'm going to create the fields, right? Uh, private string ID. Uh, and uh, private string name. Now, this is a POJO. It's a, it's a, a regular Java object. And I'm going to just re remove that because there's no reason for it yet. Uh, and I, you know, I want getters and setters and toString and hash code. So I could do all this. I could just create the toString. I could create the equals and the hash code. I could just create all that stuff. So, so modern. So Java. Look at that. So, so Java. So I could do that. Is that terrible? That's terrible, right? So I don't do that, right? I, instead, I use uh, Lumbach. Lumbach's compile time annotation processor. So instead, I just add these annotations, and it'll generate at compile time the getters, the setters, the toString, the hash code, etc. I'm going to signal that this is the primary key. And there we go. Now I have an entity. It has the fields that I want. So get name, get ID, set name, set ID, etc. Okay. And now what I want to do is I want to prove that certain things are expected and that they work. So I want to prove that the name is equal to Jane. Should be easy, right? I can run this test like so. Um, I can also uh, prove that the ID is not null, right? We want to make sure that's not null. So we say re.getID. I like that style. Uh, another th very useful variant on assert is assert, tr is assert that. And this one takes a, a second parameter of type matcher, OK? So I can say not null, right? This is a very con convenient uh, uh, matcher here. You can just use that out of the box, and it, it does basically the same thing. But there's a lot of pre-written matchers. These matchers are great if you have, oh, it's uh, re.getID. Assert that. Oh, it's deprecated, right. Am I using the wrong assert that? No, that's it. OK, assert matchers dot not null value. OK, better. So now I've got this basic test. Um, and I'm just proving that this is not null. These matchers are Java objects. They're great if you have a very complex test that you want to do over and over. You want to, you want to have a recipe for the test. You can even create your own matchers. Now, don't do this, OK? It's very tempting, because that's the type that's expected. When you create a matcher, what does it say to you? It says, <laughs> why is that there? I think they're trying to communicate. I just feel like they could have <laughs> I feel like they could have done a better job. So instead, you should do what it says. Base matcher, right? You can create your own base matcher. I'm okay with that though. I'm okay with what we've got. So now we've got a basic test, very good. Now what we're going to do is we're going to build another test to test that this is able to be persisted. So we're going to create a reservation document test, OK? So I'm going to be talking to MongoDB. In MongoDB, you have documents, which are like tables. Uh, sorry, you have collections, which are like tables. And then each row in the document is called, uh, sorry, each row in the collection is called a document. So I'm going to create a reservation document test. And in this test, I'm just going to, I'm going to test that I can persist data to MongoDB, OK? So persist throws exception. And we're going to inject, uh, we're going to take advantage of a thing that allow us to save data to the database. Well, of course, I'm going to use a reservation repository. If you know about Spring Data, then you know that a repository is a thing that handles the boring, soul-annihilating, tedious read, write, update, and delete 
uh, of data. I'm going to create the class like this, and it's just an interface in Spring, right? I can just say extends reactive code repository managing instances of type reservation whose primary key is of type string. Now, this is a reactive API. It's asynchronous, okay? So as a result, uh, you know, we're going to use it. Let's see. We're going to say reservation repository at save, passing a new reservation, passing a null for the ID, and then there's the name. So what I get back is kind of like a, a, a promise or a future. It says, this data will be saved, but not yet. In order to, receive, in order to actually uh, get the data to start doing anything, you need to subscribe. The problem is that that is asynchronous. So instead of trying to manage threads and all that, the Reactive API provides you this nice class called a step verifier. Here, I can say that uh, I expect the results of this asynchronous thing to match the following test. OK, it's going to be equal to Jane, like this. And r.getID is not going to be null. OK, and I'm going to then verify it's complete. That's my very simple asynchronous but still easy to read thing. OK, now, if I run this code right now, of course, it's going to fail, right? Because I don't have this object. I have not instantiated this object. I could create my own mock version of it. I could install it myself if I wanted to, but it's just an interface. So what I would much rather do is I would rather have Spring do that for me. Spring is the framework that's going to control all of these objects for me. So I'm going to say to Spring, all right, inject this thing for me, since you already know how to do that. But remember what Spring is going to do. Spring will start up. It will create the database. It will create the connection to the database, I mean. It will create the repository. It will create the web. It will create all the controllers. All of this stuff that has nothing to do with my data. I want, I want just the repository. I don't care about the web and the services and security and all that stuff beyond that, do I? So I'm going to tell Spring to just create the stuff that is required to manage the data. And in order to do this, I'm going to use what's called a test slice. This is a test slice. So I'm going to use JUnit4's uh, Spring Runner, OK, that runs it with Spring. And then this test slice tells Spring Boot, just create the MongoDB. Don't bother creating the rest of the application context. That way, I can isolate the part of the code that I want to test. It, it disables all the auto configuration. It brings in just the MongoDB components. And that's it. So now I have this application. It's going to start up, and I can run it. So let's see what that does, OK? Here we go. Good coffee. So there's my data. That worked just fine. Uh, we, can, we can prove that it's, it, it works by breaking it. I'm going to make it Janet. So that, that should fail, right? That's a, we're proving the negative. Okay? That's very important when you do testing. So there we go. It failed. So we know that the test is working because it does that, right? OK, so now uh, we've got data in the database. We're able to persist it. And we're able to examine this asynchronous data using the reactor step verifier. Very good. The next thing that I want to do is I want to build an HTTP API. Okay, So I'll say reservation HTTP test, like so. And this is just going to be a test that tests that I can get the data from the HTTP API. I haven't created the API yet, but you know we're going to need that eventually. So I'm going to create a web test client, which is a reactive HTTP client that we can use to talk to our HTTP API. I'm going to say get the URL, HTTP, localhost, 8080 forward slash reservations, or you can just do that, right? And then I'm going to retrieve the data, OK? Exchange it. I'm going to expect certain things from it. I'm going to expect that the status is OK. I'm going to expect that the content type uh, has this following header, media type application JSON. And I'm going to expect the body to have some JSON like this, OK? I'm, I'm actually asserting certain things about the data, OK? I'm using JSON path there. Very convenient. So let's, let's see what happens with that. Well, first of all, I'm not going to use data Mongo test anymore, am I? I'm using a different slice. I'm using the web testing support. Okay, so there's this runner.class. Okay, so that'll only load up the web tier. It will not load up the data tier, and you can see the problem with this, right? Because even though we have not built this HTTP endpoint, in order for this HTTP endpoint to do its work, it needs to talk to the database, doesn't it? And we're not going to have any data components in this code. It's going to fail. So let's. Let's just see what happens. Just run the test, just to make sure we're on the same page. OK, so here we go. Uh, and you can already guess what's going to happen, right? It's not going to work. So we need to actually go implement the production code. So I'm going to say reservation HTTP configuration. And here, I'm just creating a configuration class. This is a Spring class that manages configuration. In this class, I'm going to create a server uh, functional reactive HTTP endpoint, OK, like so. And this is just a functional style uh, HTTP controller. OK? Good. So that's the endpoint here. 
forward slash reservations and new handler function and server response dot okay dot body and we're going to inject the reservation repository like that find all reservation dot class okay now it's a lambda of course and so we should use lambdas very nice get rid of that make that a little bit simpler okay r and we can make this a static import like that and there's our whole http endpoint okay that's the entire thing uh, now i'm going to use that so i'm going to bring it in i'm going to say import the uh, import the uh, reservation HTTP config. Okay, dot class, there we go. And this should still fail. And can we guess why? Because we don't have the data tier, do we? We don't have the data object there. So I ran this code, and it's saying, hey, we can't do this because we don't have a bean of type reservation repository. Nothing related to MongoDB is configured anymore, right? It's going to only create the web stuff. So we need to mock out a version of the repository so that the web controller, the, the, the functional reactive HTTP endpoint, can actually inject it, right? We're injecting the re repository here, but it does not exist. One way to do this is to create a mock using Makito. Whoa. <laughs> Testing is hard. So <laughs> one way to do that is to create a mock using Makito. And uh, we could do that. But then we'd have to create the whole application context and create a configuration class that has the mock bean. All of that is very, very fragile. So we don't want to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use mock bean, the annotation. So it says at mock bean, private reservation repository. And that actually tells Spring and the test framework, it tells Spring and the test framework to create a bean of type reservation repository, make it a mock using Makito, and then replace the bean in the Spring application context of the same type if that type exists. If it doesn't exist, it'll add it to the application context. So what we'll have is a mock bean. But we don't actually need a mock, do we? What is a mock? A mock is a Java object that has the shape, the same shape of another Java object, but it's basically empty. It does nothing. It returns null and zero and false and all these basic things. It's a, it's a shell of an object, OK? What we want is a, uh, is a stub, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, Mokito, when this repository is asked to return this much data, then I want to return a new reservation with that data in it, like so, OK? So I'm using, I'm, I'm using Mokito to create a stub that says, whenever find all is called, return this reactive stream with just one element in it. Let's try running that code again. OK, out of coffee. Oh. All right, that worked. Now, that worked, and that's because we're using this nice feature, at mock bean. You can use it to replace objects in the application graph. Good. So now we've got a service that talks to the database. Let's build a client, OK? And we're going to go back here to start.spring.io, and we're going to build a client. And this time, it's going to be called a consumer. And we're going to go back and make the same selections using the greatest version of Java there is. Uh, and then we're going to use the reactive web support. We're going to use Lumbuck. And I'm going to use the stub runner. All right? We're going to hit generate. And that's going to give me a new project that I can open up in anything I want. Right? We've already talked about those options there. Uh, here we go. So wait for it. Good. Consumer. And there's my application. We're going to go to the test. Right? And what I want to do is I want to take away JUnit 5 just like I did before. We're just going to remove it here. Goodbye. OK, or just better yet. Uh, and of course, we need to either make this a real class or you know, delete it. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just going to keep it like that, hide this, get rid of that. And there we go. There's my updated code. Now, what I want to do is I want to create a client that will talk to my service. So I'll say at AutoWired, private reservation client, OK? And this client I'm going to use to talk to my service. But you can see we've already got a test failure, don't we? I don't have this type here. So I'm going to create a client, and my client is going to be responsible for talking to that service. It's going to be a Java object that other people, other teams can use to talk to this API. So I'll say this.client.getAllReservations. And I'm expecting this to return a publisher of a reactive type, a, a flux of reservations. OK? Here we are. So there's a, a few problems here. First, we need that method. Right, so we'll come back to this in a second. Second of all, we need this type. We're going to create the reservation DTO. This is a client-side representation of the type that we have on the server side. Right. So here we go. There's our very simple DTO type. And it's going to have 
the annotations here just to create the getters and the setters, all right? There's the client representation of that data type. Uh, and we have in our test the stream of data. So I'm going to say step verifier dot create reservations. Expect the, the next data that comes back will, you know, match the existing tests, right? Jane and uh, uh, r.getID is going to be not null. And we're going to then verify it's complete, OK? Uh, of course, this is going to be a Spring Boot test. We're going to run it with the Spring Runner. Right? There's a, it's a very small tr Spring Boot app, so it doesn't really matter in this case if we just run the whole thing. If we run this, it's probably not going to work, is it? Right? And, I, and there's a few obvious reasons, I think, but let's, let's just go ahead and run it and see what happens. Right? Oh, it's the wrong test annotation. <laughs> Goodbye to this. Good. I was using the JUnit 5 uh, test annotation. I was supposed to be using the JUnit 4 one. Again, you got to prove the negative. All right, so I tried to run it. I got a no pointer. Oh, no. Got a no pointer there um, for a few reasons. First of all, this reservation client is here, isn't it? It's right here. Uh, and I tried to inject it. Is that the issue that I think I have? I think that's the issue, right? I have a reservation client. It's null. I then called. It's not null, but then I call this, and it returns null. So I need to actually make that work. I can make that work by creating a web client. This is a reactive web client that I can use. I can say this.webclient.get.uri HTTP localhost localhost 8080 forward slash reservations. All right, uh, and we're going to say retrieve body to flux reservation dot class. Okay, okay, good. Look at that. Now, we need to inject this into the constructor, so I'll use lumbuck again. Uh, and there we go. There's my implementation. Is that going to work? Let's find out. And of course, it didn't work, right? It didn't work because we don't have the bean web client defined anywhere. So we need to go back to our code and define that here. So we say at bean web client, web client dot builder, return builder dot build. All right, good stuff. Let's do that again. Good. Look at that. Still didn't work. And, but this one we could have seen coming, right? We could all anticipate this. Look, it said that it tried to make a network request, and we got connection exception, connection refused. What happened? Well, I'm not running the service, am I? Of course it's not going to work. Why would it work? I'm not running the service that we just built. And this is where we get into a very serious problem. You see, I don't know about here in beautiful France, but in where I come from, I live in a small little village in Northern California called San Francisco. And in San Francisco, in San Francisco, culturally, there are some things that you can do that are very polite, very friendly, very welcoming. And then there are some things that you can do that are very impolite, very vulgar. So for example, if somebody comes to your office, to your organization to work with you, it's very friendly, it's very welcoming, it's very polite to say, hello, come in, have a seat. Here's some coffee, right? Welcome. It's a very friendly thing to, to do that. It's very rude, maleduque, vulgar, impolite to say to someone who's come to your office or to your organization, it's very rude to say, welcome, hello, have a seat, have some co coffee, welcome, and now deploy this Kubernetes cluster just to test your stupid app, right? <laughs> it's very rude. It's very rude. People will quit. They'll leave your office. They'll leave. They'll quit. They don't want to work. Nobody wants to be told they have to deploy Kubernetes just to test an iPhone client. It's ridiculous. And I have a MacBook Pro. This has 32 gigs of RAM. When I bought it, I was expecting that it would be enough to be able to run Slack and Chrome <laughs> at the same time. We're not there yet. The technology has not gotten there yet. I can run a small Kubernetes cluster, though. Not a big one, but a small one. And you heard about the new Mac Pro with 1.5 terabytes of RAM, only $30,000. <laughs> now you can run Slack and Chrome, <laughs> right? And Kubernetes, which is amazing to me. But the point is, most people are not so lucky. They can't run the Kubernetes cluster if they wanted to. So we get into a problem. I want to test this thing, but I don't want to run that whole cluster. So I have a network service. How do I do this? How do I fix this? Well, one way to do it is to mock out that service, just like I mocked out the collaborating objects back in my unit tests, right? So what I'll do is I'll use a project called WireMock. WireMock gives me the ability to say, I want to mock 
any, uh, I'm going to mock a URL, a, a git to a URL called reservations, like so, and I will return a wire mock response that has an HTTP status, like so, of ok.value. I'm going to return a body. I'm going to talk about the body in a second here. And I'm going to return a, um, a header, HTTP headers, dot content type is going to be equal to media type dot application JSON value. OK? Easy, right? Ugh. So we're going to add the static imports. That makes it a little bit cleaner. Uh, OK, add on demand static import. There you go. A little bit better, but still horrific. But either way, that should work. We just need to say auto configure wire mock. OK? Port equals 8080. So what I'm doing is I'm mocking out the HTTP endpoint. I'm saying, when somebody goes to this endpoint, they're going to get the status HTTP 200 and this content type. And then we have to return a string. And that string, we can just say var body equals, uh, and then we're going to say like this. It's going to be JSON. We're going to return a JSON string. So like that, like this, like that, colon, like this, like that. Java 13 will have text strings. And you can try that out now. But uh, in the meantime, this is painful. Okay. So here we go. Uh, re let me see. Um, reservation name Jane. Okay, and ID one. All right. So that's the body. Return this here. Okay, that's my new API. Let's try that. Let's see if that works. Good stuff, huh? Now it worked. We mocked out the API. Are we done? Is everything fine? Of course not, right? I've got a, 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 cl a client, and I'm able to test it quickly without having to stand up the service. And I've got a service, and I can test that quickly. I've mocked out all the sort of interactions between these two things. The problem is that I've got a bit of an issue here, don't I? Something that a compiler would have caught for me if I were doing interactions on the same objects in the same, mod in, in the same monolith. Now that I've moved to distributed systems, I've got a bit of a problem. Reservation name in my client doesn't exist on the service. It's called name. So there's an integration issue that I would not have discovered ever unless I went to production. So now we're in a bit of trouble. You know about the testing pyramid, right? The testing pyramid, they say that you, you should have most of your code should be fast feedback unit tests. And then as you move up the pyramid, then you get you know, controllers and services and integration tests and end-to-end -end tests and smoke tests and security tests and so on. But, and, and then at the top, you have so, so little of those very expensive end-to-end -end tests, right? You have very little of that, mostly fast and then very little slow, right? Well, here, now that we're moving to microservices, huge chunks of our interactions with other components in the system are over the network. They're stringly typed. There's no compiler to tell you that you change this property or that one, and so it's not going to work anymore. So I've tried to mock out that network service, but I got a bad result, right? It looked fine. It was green on my client, worked on my machine. But when we get it into introduction, we find this problem. And again, this is just one attribute. Can you imagine what would happen if you had two or five or 100 right? or more objects? It would get very, very painful very quickly. Because as two different teams in the organization work on the code, you risk introducing breaking changes. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a project called Spring Cloud Contract. So far, we've been using Spring Boot, which is the basis of all that we are talking about. Spring Cloud sits on top of that, and Spring Cloud Contract sits on top of Spring Cloud. Spring Cloud Contract lets us create a, a test that captures how we expect this to work, and then we can use that artifact, that document, that contract, to then define a mock API on the client side. So we're going to go to this resources contracts directory. We're going to create a new file called should return all reservations.groovy. Now, of course, you can do this, these contracts in Java, in Kotlin, in Groovy, whatever. There's uh, there even property files, right? There's even a way to do that in YAML, I think. But I'm just going to do it like this. So I've got a request, a response. This is a DSL. What I'm doing is I'm describing an interaction with the service, just one of many. OK? So there we go. There's, I'm going to say request, and I'm going to say that the request is an HTTP GET. I'm going to say that the URL is to forward slash reservations, right? And I'm going to say that the, the, re the response is to have a status code, like so, dot value. I'm going to have a body. I'm going to, we're going to come back to that in a second. And I'm going to have headers like this, content type, media type, dot, OK, application JSON value. Now, let's talk about this body. We know that the body should look, it should be JSON. And I could 
I could just pass a string back, right? No problem. But actually, I quite like this document literal syntax that is available in Groovy, right? I can say, here's a Groovy array, and then I can have another object inside of it, uh, and I can give it keys, right? So name is equal to Jane. It, it's, it kind of looks like JSON, right? In fact, if I replaced this with that, with a curly bracket, it would be JSON. It's not exactly JSON, but it's very convenient. And actually, it's, the compiler understands that, right? So I'm creating a map, in essence, right there. Okay? So there's the contract. Now, in order for this contract to work, something needs to take this definition, this DSL, and turn it into a test that gets evaluated against our API, our HTTP API. And so we need to go to our build and configure this plugin. We've already got it configured here. We've got a Spring Cloud Contract Maven plugin. This plugin will turn our DSL, our contract, into a test. And you can have one contract. You can have tens of thousands of contracts that are very, very cheap. And they get turned into unit tests for you. And those unit tests look very similar to the unit test that we've already created that talks to our HTTP API. But remember what we did in our HTTP API. We had to create a, a, a test, and then we imported this. And then we did the mock bean, and we did the, the mock keto stuff. We did all that to, to pre-configure how things should be set up before we could then run this code here, right? So in order to do all this other stuff, in order to do this, we had to set everything up. And the same is true here for the contract. Spring Cloud Contract doesn't know how to do mock keto. It doesn't know how to do all this stuff. So we need to give it a base class. So we're going to say base class, OK? And this base class is going to be a uh, a test, just like before, but it, notice that it doesn't say base class test. If you did that, then Janet would try to run it, and it's not supposed to be run, right? It's going to be a, uh, a Spring Boot app, or Spring Boot test. Uh, we're going to uh, give it a web environment of random, right? Random endpoint, random port, like this. You can do it two different ways, right? Server.port equals zero, or that, OK? Um, we also uh, are going to import our HTTP configuration. Reservation HTTP configuration, like that. And then we're going to have some configuration here, some before logic that gets run. And all of our classes, all of our m contracts, will be turned into unit tests that extend from this base test. So we're going to say, I want to inject the local server port. right? That's the port on which this application is going to run. And I want to do a mock bean for the reservation repository, just like we did before. Okay. There's the two pieces. And we're going to use these. We're going to say, OK, Makito. Actually, I can just go back to here. Just take all that, OK? I just did something you should never, ever do, ever. Not even when you're all by yourself at home and no one is looking. I copied and pasted code. Don't do that. So we're also going to say rest assured dot base URI equals HTTP localhost. And the port is equal to this dot port, OK? Good stuff. I like to do that normally first, OK? So this is my base class. Now we need to tell our build about this base class so that the Maven plugin can use it, use it right? So it's going to be explicit for the test mode. Good. Uh, explicit. And the base class for all tests will be com example dot producer dot base class, right? Hello. Base class. Good. OK, there it is. Let's try this out. So go to the terminal. OK, Maven clean package. Oh, did you hear that? Oh, it was so awesome. I wish I could share the joy of that with you. OK, let's see. Mm? Mm? Ah, good. So that worked. So look what happened. When we built it, it built the, the stubs jar, right? This is different. It, it built the regular jar, but it also built a stubs jar. This is the most important part. It's, ex it's installing, or will install, a stubs jar. So let's actually do that again. Maven clean install. Let's install at my local repository, my local M2 repository. Okay. Now, when it's doing that, it's going to run the code, and it's going to turn our contract into a test. And we can see that test here. Let's try it out right now. Okay. Come on. Eccolo. Okay. So, find I name contract verifier test dot Java. Okay. Cat. And there's the actual test that was generated for us based on our contract. And you can see that we, we told it to extend base class, and it did. So it says, hey, given an HTTP request 
to the, for, to, to the following URL, expect that their status code is 200, that this, the media type matches this string here, and that the body has a structure that has a JSON array that has ID equal to 1 and name equal to Jane. Okay? So it's just basically doing the same thing as we did before. It's talking to our HTTP service. It's running that test every single time it builds the code. Now, on the client side here, we can go back and we can use that installed stubs jar. We can go here and we can say, OK, instead of using Wiremock, let's use the stub runner. So at auto configure stub runner, and IDs equals to com example. So I'm, I'm giving it the Maven coordinates, right, for the actual artifact. I'm telling it to use the latest version, and I'm telling it to run on port 8080. I'm going to tell it to look in my local repository, but I could use ClassPath or a remote Nexus or Artifactory, right? I'm just going to use local because that works. But most of the time, you would use remote, right? You'd have the latest version of the dependency in the organizational uh, artifact repository. So think about how that works. This team is over there. They're working on the service. They do Maven clean install. Everything's green. They do git commit. It goes to the continuous integration. There's a build, and it goes to uh, the artifactory, right? They do Maven clean deploy at the end. And then, of course, that service is deployed into production. You do continuous delivery, hopefully. Knock on wood, or whatever this is, right? Hopefully, in 2019, you're doing continuous delivery. You're moving software on every git commit to production. And if you are, then the Artifactory version, the version of the, jar of the library in, in Artifactory or Nexus is the same thing as the code that's in production. So now, here we are on the client. Why should we test against the API from yesterday? We don't care about the one from yesterday. We care about what's in production right now. That's the latest one, isn't it? So we're going to do plus. Okay? So I'm going to use that. I'm going to comment this out. Okay? We, we don't need that anymore. And let's rerun this, and let's see if that helps us catch the bug. OK, let's see if it works. OK, look at that. No pointer exception. OK, no pointer. It said that it tried to run this endpoint, tried to run this request. It got this data back. And here, there's more data. And here, we're expecting uh, something. We got reservation equals null, reservation name equals null. Aha, there's the bug. Fix that. Go back to this code. Get name, all right? Run this code again. Nice. Huh? End to end. Now we have confidence that the code that we deployed, ah, merci, huh? the, code that we, the code that we have deployed into production, w w that we have verified on the server side. Because remember, the tests would not pass on the server side if the contract did not match the API. So the server side, the producer, would not go into Artifactory if the contract was invalid. That's why the plugin is there. It will fail the build if the contracts don't match. Then, once it's green, we are able to consume that, and it creates a lightweight mock HTTP service for us, for the test. Okay. Now, I'm using the, the, the thing on the, in my Java code here, and I can hear you say, Josh, what about those other people who are not using Spring Boot and uh, Spring Cloud and so on? What about those poor, unlucky people? What can they do to take advantage of these nice contracts, right? What about my iPhone developers and my Android developers and so on, my HTML5 browser-based developers? They don't want to run, they don't want to write their unit tests in Java. They're using TypeScript and JavaScript and, you know, Kotlin and whatever. All oh, Kotlin's JVM, you could totally use it there. But for them, we have a jar you can download, right? And that jar is called the Spring Cloud Contract Stub Runner. Looks like this. And so I've got a little script here that I wrote. You can see what it does. It says Java minus jar, server port equals 8090. Go to, and it says run this jar right here, Spring Cloud Contract Stub Runner Boot 2.1.1. And then tell it to work offline, tell it to find the local dependencies, and tell it to find the artifact in my local Maven repository that has the, artif the group ID, the artifact ID, the version, and the port. Okay? So I'm going to run that. And that's going to run this jar. And what that does is it lets me go to localhost 8080 forward slash reservations, and I get the data. So now, when somebody comes to your organization and they want to build a new iPhone client or an Android client, and they want to test against the real API, you don't have to give them a Kubernetes cluster. You give them the artifact coordinates for the contracts in your organization's artifactory, and you give them that little stub runner jar. And now they can test all they want against real data that matches the real API. My friends, thank you. I want to know something. First of all, who learned something new? Who learned something new? Very cool. Who had fun? Who had fun? I'm just wondering. Je me demande. Okay, very good. Merci mille fois d'être venu. Merci, merci beaucoup. Hein? Thank you.